Hey, this is Andrew Bowser, writer, director, and star of Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls, and you are listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to The Graveyard. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Well, one of the cool things about the Halloween season is if you're a fan of digital or physical media, now is the time to start loading up on your library. I know there are some of you out there that just love to subscribe. You don't care about owning any of it. But those of us that do like to own our libraries, um, you couldn't ask for a better time. Now, uh, Shout Factory is uh, doing their Shocktober sale. And I'm not sure where it stands as of right now. Um, it's been going on since the month of October began. And they do uh, huge discounts on a lot of their titles, their horror titles especially, horror and sci-fi. So you can check out Shout Factory and see if there's anything there that you really like. I mean, they have some great stuff there. If you, uh, if you know anything about Shout Factory, you know they carry some amazing titles. Uh, John Carpenter films, um, some great cult classics, uh, all kinds of stuff. And um, if you're going to stock up on your video library, uh, that's one place to go. Of course, Amazon, well, you can always go to Amazon, but uh, they've been having some really interesting sales on horror, especially since they had their two-day, um, I guess it's uh, Prime Days, uh, that they had on October 10th and 11th. Uh, I saw some really interesting deals on some great stuff as well. I saw the movie Smile on Blu-ray uh, on sale for $4.99 uh, with a, um, I think it's, uh, you get the Blu-ray and it's also with the digital uh, screener that you get as well. And I think normally it's like $20 or something. So they had a great sale on that among uh, many of the other box sets. Um, so, of course, Amazon you can go to all year long if you just hit it at the right time, especially with uh, Black Friday coming up soon in about another month. Uh, you'll find some amazing deals there as well. Now, Amazon and Shout Factory aren't the only two places you can go. Um, another place you can go is obviously iTunes. You can go to iTunes or um, Apple TV, I guess it would be called. And um, they're doing some great sales on uh, a lot of their uh, movies as well. You can get some movies um, as low as $1.99 if you hit it at the right time. Uh, and a lot of mainstream stuff at some point gets down to the $7.99 and $4.99 range as well. Sometimes it's just for a day. Sometimes it's for a couple of days. It just depends on when you find it. Uh, if you see it, I would highly suggest doing it uh, if you want to buy it. And also, <laughs> with iTunes, it's always a good idea to download a copy I know there's some of you out there, again, that don't like to um, own your, uh, your stuff or care about doing that. But if you're going to buy something, I would highly recommend you download it because um, I've had uh, stuff that I've purchased and thankfully downloaded that don't exist on iTunes anymore. And, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is spend money on something that you, um, you can't have access to. A really good website to go to that I would suggest going to is Blu-ray.com. That's B-L-U hyphen R-A-Y dot com. Blu-ray.com. They have everything that's on sale by category. So if you want to see what's on sale on Amazon or Best Buy or at Target or at iTunes, because you can see what's on sale. And uh, sometimes things are on sale for just a little while and then they go away. Others are on sale for a few days. And it may not necessarily be promoted uh, on the website. So check that out if you're interested. Again, um, Blu-ray.com, uh, iTunes, of course, uh, Amazon, of course, uh, Shout Factory. And I'm sure there are many other sites you can go to as well that... Uh, that I don't know about. And if you care to share those, well, please do so. You can either email me at uh, gyspodcast at gmail.com, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave comments in the comment section below. Now, as you heard at the top of the show, Andrew Bowser is here. Onyx the Fortuitous himself. He's uh, the writer, director, editor, producer of the new movie Onyx the Fortuitous. And the Talisman of Souls is going to be in theaters starting October 19th. And if you want to see the trailer, you can go to the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel and you can find it there as well.
and uh, I've seen it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I was not familiar with Onyx of Fortuitous, uh, the character. So I've learned uh, a little bit about him. And uh, for those of you uh, Onyx, the Fortuitous fans out there, you're going to, I think, really enjoy it. And um, I look forward to uh, having Andrew here in just a moment to talk about his new movie. Now, this is probably going to be my final Graveyard Show podcast for the month of October. So I want to get this in again. Uh, if you have not pre-ordered your copy of In Search of Darkness, 1990 through 1994, you can do so uh, at 90shorrordoc.com. That's 90s-h-o-r-r-o-r-d-o-c.com. 90shorrordoc.com. You can find uh, the different bundles, uh, swag bundles of what you can uh, purchase in your pre-order or for your pre-order. You can see the different swag bundles that are available and um, what fits your budget. And uh, if you're not familiar with the series, or if you missed my interview with David Weiner, that is two podcasts back, you can go back and listen to that. We talked about the film. As you know, if you're a listener of the program, I'm a huge fan of the In Search of Darkness series. Uh, I think the work that David and Robin and uh, Sam Way and Weary Pines have done uh, have just been amazing. So you can check that out, 90shorrordoc.com. You can do your pre-order for In Search of Darkness, 1990 through 1994. You have until uh, midnight Halloween to get your pre-order in, uh, and then it's kind of gone. I don't know how long that's going to be gone. And um, also, just so you know, too, if you missed out on purchasing any of the 1980s versions of the In Search of Darkness films, you can do that. Uh, there as well. It'll give you some directions on how to do that. But right now, it's time to talk. Onyx the Fortuitous, as you hear in the background, we're adding a new grave. And when that happens, that means my guest is here, and it's time for me to get to work. Well, you know my next guest as Onyx the Fortuitous, but today he's joining me as himself. Andrew Bowser is the writer, director, and star of the new film Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls, which is in theaters nationwide October 19th. And what a pleasure it is to welcome Andrew to the Graveyard Show podcast. Andrew, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. I saw the film, love the film. Uh, why don't we just get right to it? Tell everybody out there what the film is about so the film is a horror comedy and a bit of a throwback to the movies that i grew up on like fright night and gremlins 2 uh ghostbusters and it's about a a fledgling occultist who wins the contest to go to his idol's mansion and he thinks he's going for a weekend of you know demon raising rituals but it turns out his idol has uh, something else far more nefarious in store for him and the other worshipers so where did the idea of the movie come from? Well, I hadn't been able to get a proper Onyx feature financed through traditional routes, and I had tried for quite a number of years. And over the years, I had pitched different Onyx features that I felt fit what the company I was pitching to was looking for. Uh, there was one that was a parody of Terminator. There was one that was a Christmas movie. There was one that was mockumentary, kind of like... Uh, almost like an Ali G movie, but with Onyx doing pranks out in public, even though that's never been a part of what the character does. And when it came down to it, I realized the only way I'm gonna get uh, an Onyx film funded is through crowdfunding. Um, no one is, is gonna write me a check to make this movie other than the fans themselves. And when I sat down to write the script, knowing that they would be my boss, and ultimately they would want me to make whatever the most fun Onyx movie is in my head, I, I came to the subgenre of, of horror comedy because that's where I like to play. That's where I like to live. And, uh, and it just naturally evolved from there. And all the creatures and the ensemble around Onyx felt like where I wanted to see him have his big adventure. So as a Kickstarter movie, can you tell people out there what it's like doing something like that? Because I'm sure there are people out there who are like, man, I really want to do a project. I want to do it as a Kickstarter. What uh, it, I know it's we don't have very much time, but like in a, in a nutshell, <laughs> what, what what's it like trying to do a Kickstarter? I could talk about Kickstarter forever because I really fell in love with the process, even though in the beginning I, uh, you know, I, I, I wondered why I was having to crowdfund as opposed to just getting a, a big budget from a studio that thought I was funny. Uh, I quickly learned that 
the crowdfunding process was going to put me in touch with my fans and my community in a way that would mean a lot more to me personally than I could have predicted. And it, it carried all the way through production. Some of the backers even visited set and some of the backers even then became actual investors in the film when we had, when we looked for further financing outside of the Kickstarter. But I think the most important thing I learned was you have to constantly be generating content in different forms and fashions to reach different people on different platforms. I would get up, I'd put on the Onyx outfit, I'd make a TikTok, I'd get the TikTok out there. Then I'd make a YouTube video, I'd get the YouTube video out there and they're different videos. And then I'd make an Instagram post and that's different from what TikTok and YouTube likes. I would record audio uh, ads that people could just take and put on their podcasts. It just took a constant cycle of making content um, and I was lucky because Onyx is known to the internet. So I had that fan base to draw off of, but he's known in different pockets. I had to get everybody to one place. I had to get everybody to the Kickstarter and that was difficult. Um, but all I could say is it takes a lot of content creation to even get the people to then finance the content you really want to make, which sure. is your bigger, bigger project. Yeah. Speaking of content creation, uh, with YouTube, social media, it certainly gives people the ability to create content. Uh, artists that normally wouldn't get shots through studio systems, uh, the ability to uh, make you know whatever they like and put it out there for the world to see. But it does take work. Um, can you talk about like what kind of work is needed to produce these videos? I think I, yeah, a lot of work. And you have to, I mean, I had to turn my garage into a little studio, taking a cue from Mark Marin. Uh, I just, I had to make a little station, a little headquarters for Onyx so that I could go down there. I had a DP friend of mine uh, build in lights and, um, and I would just go on, flip on my lights, turn the house lights off, you know, and sit down there. Uh, I had a dummy that I used for focus, and I'd set the dummy down, and I would focus, then I'd step in front of the camera. I have a C-stand with a boom arm, and I have my mic, and uh, it takes making a little production studio and, and constantly writing and editing and just being able to go on that loop over and over again. And the stuff I do, I've never been a lifestyle vlogger. The only thing I've ever done that's myself to camera is talking about the movie or asking people for money on Kickstarter. So there are always shorts, there's sketches, there's a lot of buying of props, there's space needed for props. Um, yeah, it's, it's just like being in production 24 seven. Yeah, is the best way I can explain it. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're doing things that are narrative focused and not lifestyle focused. Well, I was going to say, um, editing those videos, did that prepare you for editing your film? Oh, it, it did. The, the, the Kickstarter was such a push and again, just constant creation that it was very easy to take that energy right into the feature and honestly, all the way through editing. And then after we got into a number of festivals, I was able to kind of disengage from feeling like I was in a constant state of production, but now ramping up for the film's release, I've been able to get right back to that place where I think I shot something like 30 videos in two weeks that I'll be putting out over the next couple of weeks. And some of them, I have other editors working on, some of them I'm cutting. I, I edited two videos on the plane to Spain. I'm Jeez. here for a festival. I edited a video this morning in my hotel. I edited a video on the train heading to Dolly's museum. Um, that's that's what it takes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you probably learned more about editing than you ever thought you would ever need to know. <laughs> well, you know, what's so funny is I, freshman year of film school, I, I tried to shoot a feature the summer of my freshman year, and I didn't know how to edit. And I, 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 when I brought back the footage, I took it to an editing student, and I, an editing major, and I said, you cut my film. And I gave him the hard drives and he said, yeah, sure will. And he, we wrote down some dates where I'd show up to his apartment and check in. And I came back six weeks later and he said, oh, I, uh, sorry, man, I actually haven't touched it. Uh, but do, do you want your hard drives back? And in that moment, Whoa. I told myself, well, I'm never gonna be in this position again. And I taught myself Final Cut Pro. Oh, actually I learned on a Steam bag. I learned to edit on film. And wow. then uh, Final Cut, uh, my school was SVA, the School of Visual Arts in New York, and I, I went there the year they were going from film to digital to nonlinear editing. And I have edited nearly everything I have shot since then. And it might be because uh, I need that control, but it's also, it's given me more insight as a director. I don't think we could have made the Onyx movie in the time that we made it if I wasn't also an editor. 
um, knowing where I'm going to cut, knowing when I'm going to cut, et cetera, really made us be able to move through our days quickly. Um, and I used to resent being an editor. I made most of my living in LA as an editor. And I thought, what do I, I'm not an editor, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a director. And now I, now I realize like it's all, it's everything. It's, it, I needed that skill and I pro I'll probably never stop editing. Well, I think it's great because you know, you're not the first um, filmmaker I've had on the program who's directed and cut their film. I think it's something mm -hmm. that's, I think it's a very established thing now. Um, yeah. where filmmakers are cutting. It makes more sense. And like you said, it, it helps when you're filming your film, when you're making your movie that you can go, oh, okay, will this work here? Will this cut here? It gives you just additional information. So you're not going into your editor and your editor turning around going, I can't do anything with this because we don't have the proper coverage. I mean, there was literally, and this is not any kind of brag. This is just to talk about how dialed in we had to be given the size of our independent film but there was literally nothing that we cut in the film in a way that i hadn't planned on cutting it i mean it is cut exactly how it wow. was planned on being cut um and uh, even down to like which jokes play in a wide versus a close um the only thing that we wound up rearranging on the day but then that became the plan was there was a sequence where we ran out of time to get proper coverage going from our master all the way to closes etc and so my DP came up with an idea to shoot only one kind of roaming master and then these disjointed close-ups that were all gonna be from Onyx's perspective as he's peeking through a painting. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I could talk with my DP and realize, yeah, that cuts. We'll, we'll have that master and then we'll just have these disjointed closes and we don't even need to run the whole scene. We just run the kind of integral action. I'll always have that insert of Onyx's eye to cut to if I need, need to. And um, let's let's do it. And then it cut together exactly as we figured it would. Um, but that was one of the only sequences that changed on the day as far as our plan. And that was because of time, um, who, which is the real master of yes. <laughs> indep independent film. Oh, yeah. It's always the race against the clock, right? The minute you get on set, it's like tick, 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 tick. All right. How many pages yeah. do we have to shoot today? How many pages? Yep. <laughs> Oh my gosh, plus practical I know. facts, plus everything else, which I'll get into in just a second. Um, as you mentioned, the horror comedy, the, the film is a horror comedy. I want to ask you, um, balancing the horror and the comedy, is it easy? Is it difficult? Is it something that when you wrote it and, and shot it, did you go, mm, yeah, talk to us about that? Well, I think initially I thought the Onyx horror comedy would be really gory. I thought it would be him in an Evil Dead type scenario where he's maybe having to cut off limbs because he's getting possessed and there's blood spraying up on his face, et cetera. But then when I sat down to write the script and I started writing this ensemble of characters around him, I realized that the personality of the film was going to become a lot friendlier than that, even though Evil Dead 2 is arguably my favorite movie possibly of all time. Uh, it just wasn't the, the right kind of a touchstone for the Onyx horror comedy. And I realized it would be more of a gateway horror film that had some creepy moments and some unsettling visuals, but never really has gore and never really goes full horror. Um, and I think that's the right space to land in with this character, especially with his first outing in the larger narrative context. I think if we do get to make a second or a third Onyx movie, there might be, you know, sequences that become more horrific, um, especially if other villains are introduced that might be more dangerous and damaging to him and his friends. But this, I think, was the right space to play in for his first film. Keep it a little little warmer. A little warmer, yeah. Um, yeah. Your cast was fantastic. Um, two of the names that stand out are our former reanimator and From Beyond co-stars, Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton. Um, they both seem to be having an amazing, fun time in their roles. What was it like yeah. working with them? They were both wonderful. Uh, Barbara, I've worked with a couple of times um, before this, but I'd never worked with Jeffrey and um, I just had a blast with him. And I think he had a great time playing Bartok. Um, he was game to shave his head and wear this facial hair, this goatee. He loved all the props and the wardrobe. He just really got into it. And I liked his energy up against Onyx. Um, I liked how dismissive he was, and I liked that normally, I think Jeffrey occupies a similar space to Onyx. I could see us, maybe not Onyx, but Andrew playing Herbert West, you know? We can be a little wily underdog pushed into a corner that has to get scrappy and maybe loses their cool. But I like that in this movie, he is 
a, a bigger, almost hammer horror villain mm-hmm. um, to, to Onyx. And uh, the first day we shot with him is the, the the scene in the film where he introduces our characters kind of to the audience and welcomes them to the mansion. And it was a scene that was trimmed down in the edit purely for runtime. But watching him perform that whole scene the first day was a dream come true. I felt like Stuart Gordon. I felt like <laughs> I, I felt like I, I could feel Stuart kind of looking at me going, you know, um, yeah. He's killing it, you know. <laughs> this, this is this is why I like that guy so much. This is why I had JC in so many things because he can do a really bang up job. <laughs> yeah, I I was just watching like those early scenes with him and and just some of the ritual scenes he's doing, and I'm just like, man, he's just he's loving this. You could just tell he really was, and he was out in the graveyard with us, getting you know knocked around and in the dirt, and he just was always a team player and was always there to to get bruised and dirty with us well i'm sure too as a director that's one less thing you have to worry about right you have these actors who come from all amazing backgrounds that you know when the camera's rolling that you're going to get their best and that's one less thing you have to worry about in your very long uh-huh. time. oh yeah the fact that i think it helped that i was on camera as well because there was nothing that an actor had to do except for olivia had to do things that i did not have to do i did not have to become a mouse and wear a corseted white dress on the same day. Um, but I think for the most part, I was in every situation that I asked my cast to be in. Um, you know, I had prosthetics on for a sequence and I was out in the cold in the graveyard and it was raining and I was in my underwear. Um, and I think that helped, that helped because it's, it, it levels the playing field. And also I know what I'm asking of them. Yeah. I, I know how cold it is. And I don't get to wear the big, you know, cozy jacket yeah. off at, mon- at monitor. I'm on the, <laughs> I'm on camera with them freezing. Yeah, you're showing your commitment. Yeah, yeah. And it really made for a real, um, yeah, it was just a real environment of, of team players. Everybody really showed up to be a collaborator. And I, that does not always happen on any film set. So I'm really thankful that it did. Well, uh, as I wrap it up here, um, I want to ask you about the practical effects. Um, I'm a child of the 70s, but a product of the 80s, so I love practical effects. I can't get enough of them. I'm so happy when I see modern movies go to those uh, practical Mm -hmm. effects. Um, Was that something that you you definitely were going to do? Like there was no way that you were not not going to do practical effects? We were always going to do practical effects, but... I did not plan on every monster being a puppet. I thought some of the creatures, especially the ghouls, and even Abaddon the tall demon, maybe they would be makeups, or the demon would be a a man in a creature suit, kind of a hybrid uh, with some animatronics. But I always knew the beefy bad boy and box demon would be puppets. Actually, that's not true. Box demon was going to be a makeup through a box, and there was going to be a performer sitting in there with kind of like puppet hands yeah but when i sent the script to adam doherty who was the creature designer that i wanted to work on the film i was a fan of his from seeing him at horror conventions he's the one that read it and said but why aren't all of the creatures puppets and i thought well i don't know i I just hadn't thought that and he said oh i think this whole world needs to have puppets i think it needs to feel like dark jim henson And, and he was right i think it it better informs the tone in ways i think if we had done Uh, even just more traditional practical effects, it wouldn't have worked for Onyx. The aesthetic is one of kind of like an acknowledged artifice and and a a playfulness. I mean, it really is meant to feel like Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I think that puppets aid in that aesthetic. Well, it definitely comes across. It's so much fun. It really is. Um, And yeah, it just adds to it. Um, The ghouls to me kind of reminded me a little bit of Life Force. So I got a kick out of that. I was like, oh, this is so awesome. (laughs) Oh, Life Force was in the deck as far as the inspiration. Life Force was there. (laughs) It was definitely great. Well, you and everybody on your team did an amazing (laughs) job with this film. Um, If anybody wants to follow you on social media, are you on any of the platforms? Yeah, you can just look up Andrew Bowser, director, and then my YouTube channel is Bowser Vids, and that's where you can find me. Fantastic. Well, listen, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the Graveyard Show podcast. Again, Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls opens nationwide October 19th. Andrew, thank you so much. It was really a lot of fun having you here on the program. Uh, Would love to have you back on when you do a sequel. Heck yeah. Thanks for having me, caretaker.
And as I put this interview to rest, I want to again remind you, Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls in theaters October 19th. Check it out. And it was great having Andrew on the show. Um, the movie is very impressive. And the practical effects in this thing are great. It, it is definitely a throwback to the 90s. And it reminds me of the movie PG Psycho Goreman. I love seeing movies that do practical effects. It's just, it's how I grew up. It's how I saw movies. And uh, yeah, there's just nothing better than that. It's just, it, it, even, even when it looks fake, it looks real. You know, it's something that just sometimes computers just cannot give you. Um, as impressive as a lot of visual effects uh, are and computer effects are, there's just something about a practical effect that just makes it tangible. You just, it's great. It's like when you watch Jaws, you know that the shark is mechanical, yet that thing is absolutely frightening. Okay, that's going to do it for me, my friends. Uh, listen, have a very happy, safe, uh, fun Halloween out there. Um, I hope all of you have an amazing time. And I know things right now in the world are crazy. Hopefully we can find a little joy when we can in, in some things and find a small distraction to take us away from real world events. Uh, please be safe out there. Have an amazing time. Have a great time. And uh, stay tuned. I'm going to have more stuff coming your way in November, December as well. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and tell your friends. Uh, I always look forward to uh, having new friends and listeners here on the Graveyard Show podcast. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Happy Halloween, everybody. Ooh.